Okay. Um, so the purpose of today's lecture is to talk a bit about randomized algorithms. Now, in your previous studies, specifically 109 and 161, you already learned some of the tricks of the trade of analyzing randomized algorithms. Uh, you probably saw applications to the running time of quick sorts and perhaps some analysis of hashing as well. Now, there's also this class 265, which is entirely about randomized algorithms. So sort of like more than you ever wanted to know about randomized algorithms. It's an awesome class, so I encourage you to take it. Um, but so in 261, we kind of have this one lecture, which is sort of a bridge between, you know, the introductory stuff in 161 and 265. Um, and specifically, you know, there's some tools which you don't learn in lower level classes, most specifically the, what we'll call the turnoff bounds, which get used all the time. And in particular, any future algorithms course that you'll take, you'll need them. And also a lot of machine learning classes, you wind up needing to know some of these probabilistic tools as well, okay? So, um, you know, so you should have seen, you've seen probability now in many previous courses. So just to kind of like remind you what the standard setup is, but again, hopefully your intuition is reasonably well developed for this stuff. So we have a state space. So for us, we're thinking like there's a randomized algorithm. It flips some coins and a point in the state space is just the sequence of heads and tails that the algorithm happened to flip. Okay. So Omega sort of captures the randomness, which you don't know a priori. A random variable, that's just a real valued function defined on the state space. So again, for us, we usually think about an algorithm. So say like for a fixed problem instance, we might be interested in the function of the running time. So as a function of the coin flips made by the algorithm, what is the running time of the algorithm? Or, you know, as a function of the coin flips, what is the objective function value of the solution produced by the algorithm? Those are the kind of random variables that we care about uh, in the analysis of algorithms. And of course, like the first thing you kind of might want to know about a random variable is what is it on average, okay? So a random variable will take on different values at different points in the state space. But you might want to say on average over any, everything that might happen, you know, what's the average value? So that's just the expectation, okay? So you just average the possible values that the random variable could take on weighted by whatever probability distribution you're assuming on the state space, okay? So for example, if it's just uniform random coin flips, this is all just going to be with respect to the uniform distribution, okay? Uh, and then finally, you know, just to remind you about this key concept of independence. So, to, so an event, remember, is just a subset of omega. So an event just tells you whether sort of something happened or didn't happen. So if you look at the, if you look at the probability of the intersection or conjunction of two events, if they're independent events, by definition, they factor. Okay, so this is the definition of what it means for two events to be independent. Probability is factor. And then if you have two random variables which are independent, meaning that the events of them taking on any particular pair of values are independent events, then expectations factor. Okay, so this is true for independent random variables. Notice that neither of these is true if they're not independent random variables. Okay, so like imagine you had an event E1 and then you, E2 was the complementary event. So exactly one of E1 or E2 happens, but not both. Well then on this side, you'd have a zero because they're complementary events. But on the right-hand side, you'd have a positive number times a positive number. Okay, so the equality would fail. Similarly here, if you had X and Y were the indicator random variables of complementary events, this side would be zero and this side would not, would be positive. Okay, so it's certainly, um, you know, certainly plenty of examples of things which are not independent. We'll see examples today of both independent and non-independent uh, random variables. And so, you know, using sort of approximation algorithms is kind of the framing device. We're going to talk about five kind of really essential tools for the analysis of randomized algorithms. A couple of these you've seen before, so I'll treat them very quickly, uh, but maybe at least one or two you haven't, and so I'll spend more time on those. So here's number one, the first of our five essential tools, okay? linearity of expectations. Super simple, but super useful. Okay, so you've seen this before. Let me remind you what it is. And then we'll put, it, we'll put it to use in approximation algorithms in a second. So suppose you have n random variables all on the same state space. Okay? And uh, linear expectation just says you can take sums and expectations and interchange them to your heart's content. Okay? You can just like swap them back and forth and it's the same number. And so the point here is that the reason it's so powerful is there's no independence assumption. Okay? Not necessarily independent. Okay? Oh yeah, what's the statement? So the statement is the, expect, the expected sum is equal to the sum of the expectations. 
So like when I teach CS161, I give 20 lectures. I put a box around exactly one thing in the entire quarter, and this is what I put a box around, okay? Because sort of like the, the bang per buck is sort of how easy it is versus how useful it is is just is sort of off the charts. Uh, I'm not going to prove it. The proof is sort of trivial. You just expand the expectations into sums. You reverse the order of the double summation. This is what you get, okay? What else? Okay, right. So that's the key thing to remember about linear expectations. They need not be independent. Now, why should you care? What can linear independence, uh, linear, excuse me, linearity of expectation do for you? Well, here's sort of the canonical use case in, the, in, in a lot of things, but in particular in algorithms. Imagine you have some random variable that you really want to understand, okay? Like the number of comparisons that quicksort makes, okay, for example. Or the number of iterations that a randomized min cut algorithm takes to terminate, something like this. Often, you can take a complicated random variable that you care about, like the number of comparisons used by quicksort, and write it as a sum of much simpler random variables, often, in fact, just 0, 1, or indicator random variables. Okay? So linear expectation then says, if you want to understand the expe expectation of this complicated random variable, that task reduces to just understanding the ex expectation of each of the simple constituent random variables. Then you just add it up, and you get the answer that you wanted. Okay? So if you like, think of this as a reduction from complex random variables that are really sums to just analyzing the sums independently. Okay? And uh, so this is, this is all kind of very elementary, but this already gives us actually some pretty interesting results. Again, you've seen some in previous classes, but let me give you an application in approximation algorithms. Where this is the only tool we need. Okay. So it's the max 3 sat problem. Okay, so you know about sat or 3 sat. That's a yes no problem. This is an optimization problem. The input is the same. So I give you a 3 sat or 3 CNF formula. M clauses, each with three distinct literals. So remember how this works. In a sat formula, you have variables, Boolean variables, x1 through xn. A literal is either a variable or its negation. And a clause is a disjunction of three literals. So it's going to be something like x3 or not x7 or not x10. Okay? So that's a particular clause, this triple, this disjunction of three literals. And then the CNF formula is a conjunction. So ideally, you want to satisfy all of those disjunctions if you can. So that's the SAT problem. Can you or can you not satisfy all clauses simultaneously? The max SAT problem says, well, if you can't satisfy them all simultaneously, at least satisfy as many as you can. Okay? Do the best you can. Okay. given a possibly unsatisfiable formula, all right? So that's the max three set problem, just number of satisfied clauses. Okay, so output, truth assignments, so you're just going to set each variable to either true or false, and you want to maximize number of satisfied clauses. This includes the SAT problem as a special case, right? That's just checking whether or not the optimal solution is M. So certainly this is an NP-hard problem. Okay. No doubt about that. But it turns out it's actually, and linear expectations will tell us this, it's actually sort of embarrassingly easy to get a kind of pretty good approximation guarantee. So here's the claim. Imagine you took a random assignment, meaning for each variable, each of the n variables, you assigned it independently, uniformly at random, to either true or false. Okay, so among all two to the n possible truth assignments, you just pick one uniformly. So up here, our state space for this claim is just omega is all possible truth assignments. The distribution is just the uniform distribution. If you do that, and you look at the expected number of clauses that you satisfy, You're going to satisfy at least 7 eighths of the clauses, or 87.5%. Okay? Now, opt can't possibly be any bigger than M, so by being within 7 eighths of M, you're certainly within 7 eighths of opt. So, in other words, picking a random assignment is a 7 eighths approximation algorithm. 
at least with respect to the expectation. Okay. So this has a sort of existential consequence, which in my experience many people find very counterintuitive. Every single three-set formula, no matter how deviously you pick all those clauses, admits a truth assignment so that seven-eighths of the clauses are satisfied. You can always satisfy seven-eighths. Why? Well, a random assignment satisfies, in av on average, seven-eighths of the clauses, so there's got to be some truth assignment that does at least as well as the average. Okay? So you can always satisfy seven-eighths of the clauses with the three-sat formula. Okay. So any, um, any questions about that before we do the very short proof? Well, define efficient. I mean, uh, you know, just picking one at random is pretty efficient. So you want a deterministic algorithm. Mm. I'm, I'm just wondering, because we can only prove the existence, but can't. No, 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 no. This claim, th so the existence is a consequence of the claim. The claim says, flip one fair coin for each variable, and on average you'll satisfy seven-eighths of them. So the expected number of clauses is indeed a seven-eighths approximation algorithm. You could ask about a deterministic algorithm, is that what you're asking about? Yeah. So you can, um, basically, we'll talk about something called Markov's inequality in a second, and I won't go through it in detail, but just to tie the things together, a Markov inequality type argument will say you have at least, say, a 1% chance of getting 87.4%, and then you can just run it a bunch of times. Okay? And it's gonna succeed once, now it's with very high probability. There's other ways to just completely de-randomize it, which is also not very hard, but it's outside the scope of this lecture. So, so you can absolutely get a, a deterministic 7 eighths approximation. Other questions? It's a good question. All right. So proof, well, we're going to use exactly the same template that I told you about. We're going to, so what is the random variable that we care about? Well, obviously, the random vari variable that we care about is how many, the number of clauses which are satisfied. Okay. So we're going to decompose that into a sum of very simple random variables, analyze each of those separately, and then add it up, and we're done by linearity of expectation. So proof. So define a random variable xj for each clause. So let xj be 1 whenever clause j is satisfied, or 0 otherwise. Okay. So this is a random variable. Again, our state space is just truth assignments. So omega is the two to the n truth assignments. Given a truth assignment, you certainly know whether or not clause j is satisfied. Okay? And it's just equal to one or zero accordingly. So in other words, it's the indicator random variable for the event of clause j being satisfied. Now, this, these are our simple random variables. So we're just gonna analyze their expectation directly. And then we'll sum them up. So what's the expected value of xj? Well, for indicator random variables, the expectation is just the probability that the event actually happens. Right? So just expanding. Um, right, so the j, j satisfied plus 0 times the probability that j is not satisfied. Okay. So that's just expanding the definition of expectation. Obviously, we don't care about the zero, and the one we can ignore. So the expected value, and this is true for any zero, one random variable, the expected value is just the probability that it's equal to one, okay? i.e. that the event occurs. So let's zoom in on this clause, the jth clause. For simplicity, maybe it's the clause x1 or x2 or x3. What's the probability that this clause gets satisfied? Well. How could it not be satisfied, x1 or x2 or x3? The only way you could screw it up is if you managed to pick x1 false, x2 false, and x3 false. Any of the other seven out of eight possibilities satisfies the clause. We're picking a truth assignment uniformly at random, so the probability that we get one of the seven that work is seven out of eight. And of course, there's nothing special about x1 or x2 or x3, any clause. Only one out of the eight possible assignments to the three variables contained in the clause could fail to satisfy it. So that's where the seven eighths comes in. Okay. This is also where I'm using the assumption that uh, the three literals are distinct in each of the clauses. Okay. And I'm using that they're independently chosen. 
Okay. And now we're done. So sum of xj's from j equal to m, this is the number of satisfied clauses by definition. By linearity of expectation, we can reverse the summation and the expectation. We just argued that this is 7 eighths exactly for every single clause j. So we're just adding up 7 eighths m times. And that's the proof. Other questions? Yep. Does this take negation Yep. So imagine the clause was not x1 or not x2 or not x3. The only way you could screw it up is by picking true, true, true. Any of the other seven are going to work. Yeah. So you really have a one in two chance to get each of the variables right. The clause is satisfied if any of the three variables are right. So there's only a one in eight chance in screwing it up. There's a seven in eight chance of getting it, getting it right. Other questions? Okay. All right, so um, it's remarkable, if maybe a little depressing, that uh, if P is not equal to NP, you actually cannot beat seven eighths for the max three set problem in the worst case. Okay, there's no polynomial time algorithm with approximation ratio better than seven over eight unless P equals NP, which is a little kind of it's kind of hard to know how to interpret this because clearly this is not the algorithm you're going to be using in practice. It, notice this algorithm never even looks at what the clauses are. And it gets a 7 eighths, and there's no way you can do better in the worst case. Okay? So obviously there's a lot of things you could do um, in practice to try to do better. But in theory, in the worst case, we can't do better. Okay. So some announcements. Uh, so problem set four, the last one. I'm sure you're happy about that. Uh, it's due Tuesday. Exercise number nine, I'll post shortly, either today or tomorrow. I'm not sure whether or not there'll be an exercise set number 10. Yeah. Oh, let, let, sorry, let me finish the announcements and then I'll take the question. So I don't know uh, yet whether or not there'll be an exercise set number 10. If there is, it'll be optional. Okay, so exercise number 10, if it exists, will not be important for the final. Speaking of the final, uh, it's at the standard time, so that's going to be Monday, um, March 14th, 3.30 p.m. time slot. The room got assigned, it's 300, 300. Um, and one thing you should know, so it's closed book, except uh, I'm happy for you to bring in two sheets of notes, that is four pages. Okay, so two sheets, double-sided. Uh, you can have arbitrarily small font size, but you have to prepare them yourself. Okay, they should really be uh, your own work. And a little bit about the final, so it's a three-hour exam, but I expect many of you will finish uh, earlier. It's, it's intended to be, frankly, kind of easy if you've been actually coming to lecture and sort of following the class. So unlike the problem sets, which are really pushing you to sort of, you know, expand your knowledge of algorithms, the final is just meant to test, like, your basic understanding of the most important concepts in 261, as covered in lecture. Um, and so I, I promise you that at least half the problems will be literally identical to stuff that's on the exercise sets. Uh, the other half of the problems will be at roughly the same level. So uh, much, much uh, less substantial than the problem set questions. So any uh, questions about um, the final or other logistics before I go back to this technical problem? Cool? Okay, so you were saying. Yeah, so it is equal. You're right. I mean, you know, claim's still true, but uh, but you're right. I mean, it's it, it it's a good observation that's exactly seven eighths m. Somehow, like as far as our interpretation from an approximation algorithm standpoint, this is the direction of the equality that we're interested in. But you're right; it's no better than that. Absolutely correct. All right. So. Uh, so the linear expectation is, is great if you're happy just analyzing the expectation of a random variable. It's really, uh, it sort of does what you need in many cases. So, but if you want to make a different statement, if you want to not say, talk about the average value of something, but you want sort of a higher probability guarantee, so if you want to say some number is big or some number is small almost all the time with high probability, that requires different tools. Okay, and so these tools are called tail inequalities. And this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the lecture. Okay? 
So the point of a tail inequality is to say that a random variable is very likely to be quite close to its expected value. Okay, so there's not much fluctuation. People often talk about this being proving the concentration of a random variable. So if you think of like the density function, you know, this should sort of be this big spike. You know, so think about like a Gaussian that's kind of very skinny. Okay, so you want sort of sharp concentration around the expectation. Now the way it works with tail inequalities and just randomized algorithm analysis, sort of no surprise, the stronger the assumptions you can make about the random variable you're talking about, the sharper the concentration you can prove. Okay? And so it depends on sort of the context, how much you have going for you, and depending on how strong your properties are, you're going to be able to prove better concentration bounds. So my plan next is to just show you the three most frequently used points on this trade-off curve. We're going to start with one where you assume like nothing and what you prove is very weak, and then we'll culminate with turn-off bounds where you assume much more, but you prove really quite sharp concentration. Okay? But all three of these are useful in many, many different contexts. Okay? But so just keep that trade-off kind of in mind as we do them. And my plan is, so just to, you know, make the trade-offs between these tail inequalities as clear as possible, I'm going to back off from approximation algorithms a little bit. I'm going to talk about a simpler setting, namely just hashing. But then at the end of the lecture, I'll bring it back and show you some ramifications for approximation algorithms. Okay? So as we discuss these, there's going to be three. Uh, I want to use as a running example, um, uh, sort of the load of buckets in a hash table. Say a hash table with chaining, you can think about it. So, just to remind you of the setup for hashing. So let's script H be a family of hash functions. Family just meaning set. Hash function just meaning a function H taking a big universe, think of this as like 32-bit or 64-bit values, and mapping it down into some small number N of buckets. Okay. So here's your huge U, here's your very modest size array of n buckets, and your hash function is mapping everything to U. Okay? Good. So what I want to study is I want to study so we're going to be thinking about picking a hash function at random, little h from big H, and we want to know how sort of crowded can these buckets be, okay, in the hash table. So if you like, if you think about chaining, how long can these linked lists in different buckets be? And what we're going to see is as we assume more and more about the family of hash functions, we'll be able to prove better and better concentration of how uh, loaded the most loaded bin is, bucket is, okay? So for starters, we're just going to assume something very weak. We'll strengthen the assumptions as we go along. So for now, again, it's assumption on the hash functions. So for now, let's just assume that, you know, for any particular, you know, universe element, like any particular 64-bit value, any, it's equally likely to map to any of the n buckets. Okay, so if you just look at one element, it's going to be uniform across the n buckets. Importantly, I'm not assuming that where different elements get mapped are independent events. Okay, once you look at two of them, all bets are off. But if you just focus on one, you see it going uniformly at random between the n buckets. So for all universe elements, for all buckets, the probability, okay, and so the, the state space here is just the hash functions. We're picking a hash function uniformly at random. So h drawn from h, that h of x equal i uh, equals 1 over n. Okay? kind of a pretty minimal assumption for hash functions to be reasonable. Okay? Any given element should be mapped basically uniformly. All right. So this property is already enough to say some interesting things about expectations. So suppose we hash some subset Okay, so n is the number of buckets just, you know, for simplicity, let's say we also hash n things, okay? I don't care which n things, just some n things from this huge universe U, okay? So certainly on average over the table, we expect, you know, one item for each bucket. There's n buckets, there's n items. But more than that is true. If you just sort of zoom in on some bucket, say bucket I, the expected number of items you expect to see in any given bucket is also equal to one. And that's true by linearity of expectation, okay? So the expected load 
by which I just mean the number of elements that hash to it. So the expected load in I is by linearity of ex expectation. So again, we're using exactly the same paradigm, right? So if we care about the expected load, the expected number of things that hash to this bucket, we can just have an indicator random variable for each element of S. One if it hashes to this bucket, zero if it doesn't. Using linearity of, linearity of expectation, we just have to analyze the expected value of these indicator random variables, which is just the probability that this element maps to this bucket. By assumption, the probability that a given element maps to a given bucket is one over n, okay? So by linear of expectation, this is just going to be the sum over everything we're hashing times the probability that this particular element x maps to this bucket i. By assumption, okay, so by p1, this equals 1 over n. And remember, for simplicity, I said let's just go ahead and hash n elements. So this is going to be n copies of 1 over n, also known as 1. Okay? So it's clear so far. So this is not surprising. Okay? So again, linear expectation tells us that as long as each element is uniformly distributed, not necessarily independently, you're going to have expected load of 1 in any given bucket. So let's now turn to concentration. To what extent can we say that this random variable, the expected load in your favorite bucket I, is concentrated around the value 1? I should say, you know, I didn't just make up this statistic from nowhere. When you're talking about hashing, you really do care about this, right? So think about hashing with chaining, for example. What's going to be the worst case lookup time in a hash table with chaining? What's well, going to be whatever the longest linked list is in one of your buckets, okay? So this is really what we care about. We care about how big can the worst case load, I'm calling it, worst case number of elements hash into a particular bucket be. Okay? So again, this is sort of like, if you only cared about one statistic about a hash table, that would probably be the first one you'd pick. All right, so what about concentration? So let me talk, so here's the second of our five essential tools for randomized algorithms, Markov's inequality. This you may have also seen before. This is the one where we assume very little, but we're going to be able to conclude not a whole lot about concentration. So all we're going to assume is that we have a non-negative random variable, like this one here, for example. Uh, it should have a finite expectation. That's kind of never going to be a problem for us today. Then, for all constants bigger than 1, the probability that x exceeds its expectation by a factor of c or more is bounded above by 1 over c. Okay? So you have a non-negative random variable. It has some expectation. The probability that it's bigger than 10 times its expectation is at most 10%. The probability that it's bigger than 100 times its expectation is at most 1%, and so on. Okay? So that's Markov's inequality. All right? It's very easy to prove. I'm just going to put it on exercise set number 9. Okay? It's really just kind of a one-line argument. Good. So let's apply this. So what does this tell us? about the probability that the load in a bin is much higher than its expectation. So for example, again, fix your favorite bucket, bucket number seven, whatever. Probability load in bucket I, well, so we can take C to whatever we want, but let's take C equal to N, the number of buckets or equivalently the number of things that we're hashing. So the probability that the load in bucket I is bigger than N, well, remember, we calculated the expectation. The expectation was 1. So this means being bigger than N times its expectation. That is, C is equal to N here. So we conclude that this is the probability at most 1 over N. Okay? Obviously, you could plug in other Cs as well. But what I want, what I want to sort of, the feeling I want you to have about this is, this is like a, you know, this is nice, you know, one, one over n, it's like definitely a lot less than one, but this still seems like a really weak bound, okay? Remember, we're only hashing n things total into the hash table, 
So this is really saying, what's the probability that every single element hashes to bucket i under a random choice of the hash function h? So with good hash functions, you'd expect this to be crazy small, right? Not 1 over n. Like if you have 100 buckets, you wouldn't expect that 1% of the time, everything, every single thing would hash to exactly the same bucket. It seems crazy, right? But if we don't assume anything more than just p1, we're not going to be able to prove anything better than this. Okay, this can actually be tight if the only thing we know about a hash function is that a given element is uniformly distributed. So to see that, imagine that our family of not so good hash functions are just the constant functions. Okay, so functions of the form h of x equals i, no matter what x is. Okay? We have one hash function that always uh, hashes to bucket one. We have a second hash function that always hashes to bucket two. Dot, dot, dot. We have an nth hash function that always hashes to bucket n. That satisfies this property. If you fix an element from the universe, you pick a random hash function, it does indeed go to a uniform random bucket. It's just that every single other element you then know goes to that exact same bucket as you. So for a given bucket i, the probability that everything hashes to it is indeed 1 over n. Okay? So again, with respect to our current set of very weak assumptions, this weak Markov's inequality is basically the best you could hope for. All right? Now the appropriate response on your part would be to say, well, but this is stupid. You would never use these hash functions. You've studied good families of hash functions like universal hashing and CS161. That seems like the much more appropriate family to analyze. I, I agree. I agree. So let's do that next. So we're going to continue to assume property P1, but we're going to assume something stronger about the family of hash functions. Basically, it's we're going to assume is universal in the sense that you learned in CS 161. Okay. So, previously, if we stared just at one element, it acted as if everything was uniform at random. Now we're just going to say if we stare at any pair of elements, they're going to jointly act as if they're both uniformly at random and independent. Okay. So fix your two favorite distinct universe elements, range over the hash functions, every single combination of buckets for those two uh, is equally likely. Okay. So for all x not equal to y and u, and for all i, j not necessarily distinct in the buckets, we're going to assume that the probability, again, over the choice of the hash function, um, that on the one hand h of x goes to i, and also that h of y goes to j, this should be the same as if we were doing everything independently and uniformly at random. That is 1 over n squared. If everything was independent and uniform at random, this probability would factor. This part has probability 1 over n by our first assumption. Same thing here, so we get 1 over n squared. So zooming in on a pair of elements, they're acting as if they're independent and uniformly at random. Okay? Just a quick example. You've probably seen this before. But, uh, so this is, this is a, these are known as, uh, I should say, pairwise independent hash functions. Pairwise independence. Okay? And so what's the difference between pairwise independence and full independence? Well, think about this. So suppose you have x1 being a fair coin, x2 being a fair coin, independent, and x3, which is going to be obviously not independent of x1 and x2, is going to be x1 plus x2 mod 2. Okay, so think of the fair coin as flipping either 0 or 1. Okay? So clearly, by definition, x1 and x2 are independent. If you think about it, x1 and x3 are independent. Because okay? x3 is just given x1, x3 is determined equally likely based on x2's coin. And similarly, x2 and x3 are as a pair independent. 
So they take on each of the four possible joint values of probably one fourth. But this is certainly not an independent collection of three random variables. In fact, only four of the possible eight outcomes could occur. Okay? And, or put differently, you know, knowing x1 and x2, x3 is uniquely determined. So they're not, they're not independent. Okay? So keep this in mind. Just because looking at pairs of elements, things act as if they're independent, it does not mean that everything is independent. Okay? You still have dependencies in general. Okay, good. So, we weren't very happy about our Markov's inequality bound. We want a better bound. So we impose a stronger assumption of pairwise independent hash functions. How do we make use of this stronger assumption? Okay. So we make use of this stronger pairwise independence assumption using something called Chebyshev's inequality. So the point of Markov's inequality is to get sort of constant probability bounds when you just know something about the expectation. The point of Chebyshev's inequality is to get significantly better bounds when you also know something about the variance of your random variable. Not just the expectation, but also the variance. Then you'll be able to make stronger statements about concentration. So we're again going to assume that the expectation is finite. We also need the variance to be finite. Let me just remind you, what's the variance? You just look at the difference between this random variable and its mean. You square it, and you take the average. Okay? So variance is just average kind of squared difference from the mean. So expectation, the random variable minus its mean squared. That should also be finite, which it will be in sort of all cases we care about. And then what do you prove? Then for all t bigger than 1, the probability that x differs from its expectation by more than a t number of standard deviations. Standard deviation, remember, is just the square root of the variance. So, you know, as, as the deviation from the mean becomes more and more, more and more deviations out, we're going to have the smaller and smaller probability here. In Markov's inequality, we just had it going as 1 over c. Here, we're going to have a 1 over t squared. Okay? So, for any random variable, the probability that it's at least two standard deviations away from its mean is at most a fourth. Probably it's the most 10 standard deviations away from its mean is at most 1%, and so on. Okay? So that's Chebyshev's inequality. Okay? So it's the tail inequality, which is useful and kind of like the handle you have on your random variable is variance and not really anything else. Then you're kind of stuck with Chebyshev. Okay? So what does this mean for us, for our running hashing example? All right, so let's put this to use. So let me be a little bit more formal about the hashing setup. So in your favorite bucket, bucket number seven, whatever, the load is just the sum over everything that's being hashed of indicator random variables where this is equal to one if it hashes to bucket i and equal to zero otherwise. Okay. So x, y equals one if and only if we pick a hash function mapping y to i. Okay. So we said this at the very beginning. Right? So we already know that the expected value of this equals 1. We already knew that from p1. Okay. Uh, let me actually call this x. So as we saw, under p1, we have that the expected value of x is 1. And we've had that all along, so that's not a new idea. So what about variance? Okay, so what about the variance of the load? Well, here again, we're going to take this complicated random variable, and we don't want to analyze the variance directly. We instead want to analyze the variance of the constituent parts. Okay? So focus on just one element, y, 
which is getting hashed. Okay, so we fixed our favorite bucket, bucket seven. We think about some universe element, y. The indicator random variable about whether or not y gets mapped to bucket seven, well, that's just a Bernoulli random variable with probability one over n, right? So by property p1, y goes to bucket seven with probability one over n, otherwise it doesn't, okay? So really, this is just the variance of a Bernoulli random variable with probability one over n. So you look that up on Wikipedia, and you're like, oh yeah, it's p times one minus p, that's right. I knew that. And for our purposes, let's just use an upper bound of one. Sorry, of one over n. Okay? So very easy to just analyze the variance of one of these little guys. But what we care about is the variance of the load, okay, the overall load in bucket i. So by, this is now the first time we use P2. So the variance of x, well, if you follow linearity of expectations syntactically, what you certainly want to say, right, so this is a sum over the xy's, you'd like to say that you can reverse the summation in here and the variance operator. Let me actually write this out. Okay? That's what we do with linearity of expectation. Now, these are not expectations. This is variance, okay? Now, let's remember, actually, variances don't necessarily add when the variables are not independent. Again, think about the case where you just have two random variables. The first one is equally likely to be 0 or 1. The second one is deterministically the opposite of the first one, okay? Each one has non-trivial variance, variance a quarter. But you add them up, the sum's always one. So the sum has variance zero. Okay? So the sum of the different parts did not add up to the variance of the sum. However, we're not dealing with arbitrary random variables here. We're dealing with the sum of these xy's. xy is just the indicator for whether or not y gets sent to this bucket or not. And the different xy's, okay, they're not independent. Like, that would be nice. All right, so I guess the other thing I should say is for independent random variables, and you would have seen this in 109 for sure, variances do add if they are independent. Okay, so that's fine. Now here, so if, if we had full independence between these indicator random variables, we could write this and it would be correct. We don't have independent random variables, but we do have pairwise independent random variables by assumption, okay? So given any pair, x, y, and x, z, they act as if they're independent. So go back to your 109 notes, look at the derivation, which says that for independent random variables, variances add, and you will see that actually without any change, it continues to hold for pairwise independent random variables. Okay? So basically, you know, the variance of a sum is the sum of the variances minus correction terms, which involve the covariances of pairs of random variables, and if they're pairwise independent, all co covariances of pairs of random variables are zero. So you really just get the sum of the variances as you desired, okay? So this is just notation, this equality. This equation is using the assumption of pairwise independence and the fact that variances add for pairwise independent random variables, okay? And this is totally canonical use of Chebyshev, okay? You have a handle on variance. Why do you have a handle on the variance? Well, maybe you can just analyze it directly, or maybe you use this trick where you decompose the complicated random variable into pairwise independent, a sum of pairwise independent random variables, then you just analyze the variances of the simple ones, you get the variance of the complicated one, and boom, you're off to the races with Chebyshev, okay? So for us, the variance of each xy is at most one over n, so we're summing over the n things that we're hashing, so this is going to be at most one, okay? which sounds pretty good. That means the standard deviation is also at most one. So the expectation is one and the standard deviation is the most one. Okay. So if we plug that into Chebyshev, what do we get? So now what's the probability? Let's again just look at the extreme event. The probability that um, x is at least n, okay? So the expected value is 1, 
the standard deviation is at most one. So x being bigger than n basically means it's, it's you know, bigger than its expectation by n standard deviations. Maybe it's n minus one, but let's call it n standard deviations, okay? So in other words, t is equal to n if we think about this inequality in this format, okay? So with t equal to n, we get an upper bound of one over n squared, okay? Definitely better than our bound of one over n we got from Markov, but it still seems a little crazy. Right? Like if you had a good hash table and you hashed 100 things and you had 100 buckets, one out of 10,000, every single item would go to the same bucket? Really? Seems kind of crazy. But yet again, and this is a good puzzle for you, if the only things we assume are P1 and P2, you cannot prove a better bound. Okay? So in fact, there are pairwise independent hash function families where the expected load of something, everything will hash to a single bucket with probability one over n squared for that bucket. Okay? It really can happen. So again, you might want to think about that as a puzzle offline. So any questions? That's what I want to say about Chebyshev. Again, the takeaway, if you have a random variable where the best thing you can say about it is something about its variance, Chebyshev is, the, is what you want to go. Markov is you really can't say anything other than about the expectation. And I guess I should say, it's, I mean, it's important, not only can you say something about the variance, but the variance should be, like, small for Chebyshev to be useful. Okay. So any questions? All right. So now let's go to the other extreme point of our trade-off curve where we assume the most and we start getting really sharp concentration. So let's actually assume that, you know, we just have fully independent hashing, okay? So each pair of items match, uh, so all items are sent uniformly and independently to, to different buckets. So independently plus uniformly distributed, okay? So no dependencies at all. This is the same thing as basically saying you've picked a completely random function to be your hash function, okay? It's not a very practical hash function family, but it'll just illustrate the point. Okay. So again, clearly a stronger assumption. We'd like to have sharper concentration, but how do we use this assumption? How does this help us? So this helps us because it allows us to apply something called Chernoff bounds. And again, really in this whole lecture, probably the main thing to sort of focus your attention on are Chernoff bounds. One, because you may never have never seen them before. Two, because if you take any more classes and algorithms, machine learning, and so on, you will definitely see it again. Okay? So Chernoff bounds, this is the fourth of our five most essential tools. It's the only one with a non-trivial proof, really. Oh, Chebyshev, I forgot to say, follows in one line from Markov's inequality. So I'll put that on exercise set number nine, two. Okay, so all of our tools, while essential, have been really easy to prove so far. So Chernoff bounds, So we're going to say, suppose we know that the random variable we care about is a sum of random variables with values between 0 and 1. Okay, that, that's, those are properties we had before. But also that they're independent random variables. So that's the point of the Chernoff bound. Sums of independent random variables concentrate really well. And Chernoff bounds just give you like a magical formula to plug in parameters and see just how much concentration you have for your application. Okay. So assume x is the sum of random variables where the xj's are independent. So this is the key point. This is what we didn't have in the previous hashing contexts. And let's say they don't have to be 0, 1 random variables, but they have to be bounded. Okay? So let's scale so that everything is always between 0 and 1. All right? So they should be bounded and they should be independent. Then, here are some things we can say about the concentration. There's going to be two parts to the Chernoff bound, one saying that it's not likely to be much more than the expectation, one saying it's not likely to be much less. Today we'll only use the first one, but in general the second one is also useful. So how do you say, how do we say it can't be too much more? 
we say the probability that x exceeds its expectation by a 1 plus delta factor. Right, so if delta equals 1, we're saying what's the chance that it's at least double its expectation. This is a most, okay, sort of a weird number. <laughs> but we'll, I'll show you some concrete examples in a second. But I do need to get it on the board. This is E meaning 2.718 dot dot dot. That's what that E means. And then upstairs we have the same 1 plus delta times the expected value of x. Okay? So exactly the same number here on the right-hand side shows up in the exponent. Okay? So you're going to want to think of delta as being at least 2 so that this number inside is less than 1. Okay? So that's the first thing. So this is saying this is saying a sense in which it can't it's not likely to be too much bigger than its expectation and then also again we won't use this today but very useful probability that it's much less than its expectation is also small and here is actually a bit of a simpler formula one half delta squared again with the expectation of x okay And this is the one we will use a couple times. Now, okay, there's all these letters on the board. But here's what I want you to focus on. Okay? So first of all, I want you to focus on that there's stuff on the exponent. Okay? Which is, def which is way different than Markov's inequality or Chebyshev's inequality. There we had 1 over c or 1 over t squared. Okay? So there's this parameter parameterizing the magnitude of the deviation, but we had only this inverse polynomial dependence on the probability bound with respect to that parameter t. Here, we have something in the exponent. Exponents can get really small really fast. So again, think of delta as being at least 2, so that number is less than 1. This says that as soon as either delta is quite big, and again, big is only going to mean logarithmic here, or the expected value is quite big, as soon as one of those th two things are true, this probability is going to be getting real small, real fast. Okay? So that's really the takeaway. Okay, you've got both delta, which parameterizes how big the deviation is, plus you have the expectation both in the exponent. If either is big, you get a really good bound. Okay? All right. So, let's put this to work. Oh, so the proof, we, we totally could do the proof in 261. It wouldn't be a big deal. Take us maybe 20 minutes, 30 at the most. But it's really just the kind of thing that you prove in 265. That's really the appropriate place to spend 30 minutes on the proof of the Chernoff bounds. So for our purposes, I'm happy if you just kind of know that these are true and have a sense of how you put them to use. Okay, and know that if you ever need the proof, you're all perfectly well positioned to read it uh, in a book or in 265. Okay, so, time permitting, I'll give you three examples of Chernoff bounds. Let me give you a couple. So first, let's re return to the hashing example. Now, under our strongest assumption, that it's a totally random hash function, meaning everybody's buckets is uniformly and independently distributed, well, then this same sum we were looking at Okay, so remember load in bucket i, that's the sum over these indicator random variables, x, y, x, y saying whether or not y goes to bucket 7. Those x, y's are now not just pairwise independent, those x, y's are now independent random variables. Okay? And there's 0, 1. So the load in the bucket, i.e. capital X, is now the sum of independent 0, 1 random variables, which is exactly the wheelhouse of the Chernoff bound. Okay? So we can just apply the Chernoff bound to the random variable we care about, capital X. Okay. So the only thing, right, so we know what EX is. We know the expected load is 1. We do have this free parameter delta. Okay, sometimes it takes a little trial and error to figure out, like, what you should be taking delta to. But uh, let's start with this. So let's just start with the probability that the load in bucket, uh, bucket number 7 is bigger than the natural log of n. So remember, the expectation is 1. This is 1 for us. So for us, 1 plus delta here is log n. Okay, so it's log n times 1. So 1 plus delta is log n. 
So if you just plug in this blue circled quantity, what do you get? You get E, again, 2.718, over the natural log of n, raised to the natural log of n times the expectation, which is 1. Everyone cool with that? 1 plus delta is log n. The expectation is 1. That's what we get. Okay? So if you like, we're saying delta equal to log n minus 1. All right, so let's try to get a feel for this number a little bit. So let me ask you the following first. What if this, instead of being this weird thing, what if this was 1 over e? 1 over e to the natural log of n. That's also known as 1 over n. Okay? So if this is a constant less than 1, and you raise it to the log, well, now you just get back a polynomial. Right, so you basically took the log, and then you took the exponent, so you get back a polynomial. So here, this isn't just like, you know, one half or one over e. This is something which is really small, right, as n grows large. This is actually going to, this, this ratio is actually going to zero as n grows, okay? So this is sort of even better than any inverse polynomial bound, okay? So this is smaller as n grows large than one over n to the d for any constant d. So I hope you can see the massive improvement we're getting over when we just use Markov's and Chebyshev's inequality, okay? So first of all, we've got a much more reasonable number here, right? We're not talking about this ridiculous probability that everything hashes to one bucket. We're just talking about the probability that a logarithmic number of things goes to one bucket. And that already, we're getting a much better probability bound than we had before. Okay, before we had 1 over n or 1 over n squared. Now it's like it's better than anything you want. It's better than 1 over n to the 10. doesn't matter, okay? So it's better in both senses. Right? So you can actually get away with even a somewhat smaller parameter. And instead of log n, you put in log n over log log n. Right, so this is, to be clear, this is the natural log of the natural log of n. That's what that means. Times 3. This is the most 1 over n squared. Okay? And I'll let you go ahead and verify this if you're interested or plot it later to see that this is true. If you're wondering, like, okay, log over log log. That's kind of weird. Like, where'd that come from? It's actually not that weird when you realize, okay, suppose I wanted you to solve the equation x raised to the x equals n. So in other words, what number raised to itself is equal to some integer n? There's no closed form for that equation, but the up to lower order terms, the answer is log n over log log n. That's how it comes up. It's the solution to x to the x equals n. Why do we have an x to the x? Well, over here we have this 1 plus delta, or one, you know, 1, mi, you know, whatever, 1 over 1 plus delta, and then there's a 1 plus delta. So that's why we care about x to the x. Okay? Good. And so just, you know, just for comparison purposes, if we did plug in x being at least n, the way we did for Markov and Chebyshev, where we just got these pathetic bounds of 1 over n and 1 over n squared, here we had plugged in the probability of x being at least n, we get something exponential, exponentially small in n. We get like 1 over 2 to the n or something like that. And that maybe sounds more like about right, okay? Right, so like, you know, if you hash 100 things into 100 buckets, you're never going to see all of them in the same one. Okay, 1 over 2 to the 100. Okay, so any questions about that? All right. So, this is also a good excuse to tell you about the fifth out of the five essential tools for the analysis of randomized algorithms. This one, I'm sure you've seen before, uh, but it's used all the time. It's also, it's again kind of trivial, but super useful. The union bound, which says that for any events that you want, e1 up to ek, now in algorithms, usually these are like bad events. These are things you hope doesn't happen, like your algorithm screwing up, okay? 
So if you have bad events, so what this says is just if you don't have too many bad events and each of them is very likely, then it's very likely that none of them will occur. Okay? So precisely the probability that at least one EI occurs is at most the sum of their probabilities. So why is this true? Well, just think about your state space. An event, remember, is just a subset of the state space. So you just draw the circles corresponding to all your events. This left-hand side, this is just the area of the union of all of your events. Okay? And clearly, a way, you can only overcount the area of the union of all of your events by looking at each event separately and adding up their respective areas. This is basically like the inclusion-exclusion formula, but without any of the correction terms. So you'll only overestimate by summing these up. You'll overestimate in general because there'll be some overlaps. If the events are disjoint, that's the case where this holds with equality. Okay? So that's the union bound. So again, what's the point? If you have not too many bad events, each one is quite unlikely, then with decent probability, none of them will happen. For us, what are our bad events? Well, remember when we did this analysis with hashing throughout, we always said, well, pick your favorite bucket, number seven. How likely is it to be very heavily loaded? But really, if you think about it, if you think about a hash table or something, you care about, you don't want anything to be overloaded. You want everything to be very well balanced. But here we said that, you know, our favorite bucket, number seven, the probability that it's loaded bigger than three log n over log log n is at most one over n squared. There's only n different buckets that could be overloaded. So if we just take the union bound over this event for each of the buckets, one, two, up to n. It's a union bound over n events, each of probability at most one over n squared. So that probability is at most one over n. Okay. So any questions about that? That's sort of the, the fifth of the things, the fifth of the essential tools, the union bound. Okay. Okay. All right. Just real quick, I'll mention one sentence about exercise example number two, because I mostly want to focus on a third example. So for, sim for simplicity, I was always saying, let's suppose we hash exactly n items into our hash table. But remember, when we were talking about the true not bounds, I said the key point is that this gets small whether delta, if either delta is big or if the expectation is big. So in example number one, the expectation was not big. The expectation was only one, but delta was big. Delta was logarithmic. So let's look at the other case. Suppose instead of n items, let's suppose it's a more heavily loaded hash table. Okay? So we insert like n log n elements into the hash table. Well, we've boosted the amount by a factor of log n. So for a given bucket, the expected number of items there is no longer one. Now the expect expectation of a bucket is natural log of n. Okay? So the expectation has jumped from one to logarithmic, which means, let's just think about the probability that the max load is sort of a modest constant factor larger. Okay. 
So remember last time we had our expectation of one and we were having this sort of fluctuation of up to log over log log, which is tight actually, by the way. So in general, the longest linked list in a hash table, even with a fully random hash function, will be asymptotically log over log log. So here I'm saying, well, let's even just look at much smaller fluctuations, a factor of four. Well, how do things change in the blue circle? One plus delta used to be log n, but now one plus delta is only four. On the other hand, the expectation used to be one, and now it's the natural log of n. Okay? So delta is now constant, but now the expectation makes up for it by being logarithmic. So again, the blue circle is going to be less than one over n squared. Okay? If we just plug in these numbers for delta and the expectation. Taking the union bound over all of the buckets like before says that with probability at least 1 over n, nobody is bigger than 4 times its expectation. Okay? And this is pretty useful actually. Right? So if you have sort of a, a sparsely occupied table, then you can have big fluctuations. But if you have just even like a modest load, it's very even. So this can be useful when you're doing load balancing. You know, think about data centers, something like that. It's pretty nice that just random choices wind up balancing themselves quite evenly. It's a useful property. All right, so last example. So now I want to sort of bring it back on home to approximation algorithms. We already saw one application, max 3 sat, of randomization approximation algorithms, but let me give you a, I'll only have time to sketch it briefly, but let me just give you a sense of this. This ties in with what we were talking about last lecture, namely using linear programs to design approximation algorithms. And so in particular from last lecture, the one I want you to remember is our first vertex cover to approximation. How did it work? We wrote down a linear programming relaxation. What does a relaxation mean? It means any vertex cover corresponds to a 0, 1 solution, but then there's other fractional stuff as well in the relaxation. You solve the linear program optimally, so that gives you a lower bound on the best possible vertex cover because it's a relaxation. Now, in general, the vertex cover will have fractions, as we saw last time, and fractions don't make a vertex cover. So you've got to massage it into a vertex cover. How do you do that? You sort of round it to integers. How did we do that last time? We just said, well, you know, any variable that's at least a half, make it one. Any variable that's less than a half, make it zero. In other words, round everything to the nearest integer value. Okay, that worked great for vertex cover. The idea in randomized rounding is to, again, you solve the LP, solve an LP relaxation, And then you're going to round it to an integral solution like before, but you're going to do it probabilistically. Okay? Specifically, right, so the, the problem with the LP relaxation is it has fractions. So the idea is to interpret these fractions as probabilities and then round the fractional variables accordingly, up or down, in proportion to what that fractional value is. Here's sort of the canonical application of randomized rounding. I'll give you a graph. Could be directed or undirected. And I give you source sync pairs. Okay. So you have a graph, source sync pairs. And the question you want to know is, is, can you choose a path, just one path, from S1 to T1, from S2 to T2, and so on, up to, from ST to uh, TK, so K paths in total, 
so that no edge of the graph is used in more than one of the paths. So for example, if you have these two paths with, which, don't, which meet at a vertex but don't actually share any edges, this would be a legitimate solution. If actually those two paths also shared an edge, that would not count as a feasible solution. Okay, so you want to know, is there any way to connect everybody to everybody else they want to be connected to without using any edge more than once? Okay. So that's an MP hard problem. In directed graphs, it's NP hard even already if k equals 2. So what do we do? So what would an approximation algorithm look like? Okay. Well, we're going to do this randomized rounding approach. All right. So we're again going to solve the LP relaxation. I'm not going to write it down. You've actually already seen this LP relaxation a couple times on exercise sets and problem sets. The relaxation here is just going to be multi-commodity flow. What's the disjoint pass problem? It just says I give you a graph, I give you SITI pairs, just like in multi-commodity flow, and I want you to pick a single path for each SITI pair so that no edge is used more than once. That is, a capacity of one is respected. What's multi-commodity flow? I give you the same input, a graph and SITI pairs and you route flow fractionally from SI to TI, okay? So the LP relaxation is just going to say, does there exist a multi-commodity flow, fractional, so that from each SI to each TI simultaneously, one unit of flow is being sent, subject to a capacity of at most one on each edge, okay? So that's the LP relaxation, multi-commodity flow, unit capacities, you're trying to send one unit for each SI TI pair, okay? Now, if your LP solver comes back and says, couldn't do it, couldn't find a multi-commodity flow meeting those constraints, well, then you're done, right? Because any collection of edge disjoint paths is a very special case of a multi-commodity flow routing one unit from each SI to TI with no edge over capacity, okay? So if you can't even have a multi-commodity flow, then you're not going to be able to have um, disjoint paths. So, what are we going to do? So, we're going to, so the interesting case is where the LP is feasible. Now, it's an NP hard problem, so there's going to be cases where the LP is feasible, but there's no disjoint paths. So, we need to somehow, we want to somehow round the LP so that we still get approximately disjoint paths. So, here's what we do. So we choose a path for each, so we have the LP solution, we have the multi-commodity flow. For each SIT pair independently, we say, well, look at how it distributed flow over paths from SI to TI, okay? It sent a unit of flow total, remember. We're just gonna pick an SITI path at random with probability equal to the amount of flow on that path in the LP solution. So the fraction of I's flow, like between SI and TI, that it carries. And again, this makes sense because in the LP relaxation, a unit of flow gets sent from SI to TI. So we can interpret its fractional splitting of flow over the paths. We can interpret it as non-negative number summing to one. We can interpret it as a probability distribution. So it's well-defined to say, pick a path according to that distribution. 
And then we do that independently for each SITI pair. Okay? So that's randomized around. So what can you prove about it? With high probability, provided the LP solution, uh, the LP relaxation is feasible, randomized rounding will produce a solution such that the max number of paths using any edge is the most three log n over log log n. Okay. So these are not disjoint paths. Disjoint paths would say that the max number of paths using any edge is the most one. But again, it's MP hard, so we're not expecting to find MP uh, to find disjoint paths, but this says at least we can find a solution where no edge is used by too many paths. Okay. So if you like, this is an approximation algorithm with respect to the objective function of minimizing the maximum load on any edge of the network. It's another way to think about it. So this is the original and still to this day canonical application of randomized rounding. It's from the mid 80s. So back then, um, the authors, Raghavan and Thompson, they were motivated by circuit layout problems. So they were thinking about, you know, the graph would be like a grid, okay, where you'd be laying out a circuit. Their SITI pairs, they were contact points on the boundary where you needed to have a wire laid in the circuit in between the two contact points. And actually, this kind of solution was fine for them because you could always just sort of widen the channels in the chip so that actually a whole bunch of wires could be laid down in parallel. So the fact that over here on a single logical edge of the network, you actually are routing a logarithmic number of different things, that was an acceptable solution for the application. You just make the channels a little bit wider and you're good, okay? So how do you prove it? We're almost, we're almost out of time, so I'm not gonna prove it formally. I'm just gonna sort of argue by analogy. Really, this follows from the hashing analysis we already did, from our example number one of Chernoff bounds. And this is really the paper that ported Chernoff bounds over into the algorithms community. So you zoom in on a single edge. On a single edge, the expected number of paths that get routed on it is at most one. Why? Because in the LP relaxation, we gave this edge unit capacity. So the total fraction, total amount of fractional flow using this edge was at most one. That translates to an expectation of at most one of how many paths get chosen that use this edge. Now on this edge, once you have this, now you have this sum of random variables. Okay, so just like before, we said how many elements get mapped to a particular bucket. Now instead of a bucket, we have an edge. Instead of elements, we have these paths. How many paths get mapped, you know, how many paths get chosen that include this edge? That's exactly that same sum of random variables. Again, we have independence across commodities, so we can use the Chernoff bounds. And because all the parameters are the same, we can even stick in the same number here. Actually, I should say uh, M. So what we had before, that one over, so up there, that at most one over n squared, here we're gonna get that with probability all but one over m squared, a given edge has load no more than this. And now again, we just do a union bound over all m of the possible edges. Okay, so it's one over m squared for each edge, summed over all of them, it's at most of probability one over m that anybody has a load this big. So in that sense, with high probability, uh, this algorithm obeys this bound. So for directed graphs, this actually turns out to be the best you can do for this problem, unless p equals np. There's a matching lower bound saying it's np hard to beat log over log log n. Uh, for the undirected case, there's actually still sort of quite intriguing gap. So we don't really know algorithms better than this one for undirected graphs, but they may well exist. The best lower bounds we have are super constant, but not by much. So that's all I got for today. See you on Tuesday. <laughs>